everyone, and welcome to today's episode of our Seven Investing Podcast. I'm Seven Investing founder and CEO Simon Erickson, and I'm very excited with our guest this afternoon. Worley is a globally renowned expert on quantum computing and software development. He's a serial entrepreneur. I also vote that he's one of the world's most interesting men. Worley, it's really a pleasure. Thanks for joining me on the Seven Investing Podcast this afternoon. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. I have to go now. No, <laughs> I can't. I can't live up to any of that. But but we'll. But thank you. That was a that was a, a very bombastic intro. <laughs> yeah, it's always an interesting interview with you, Worley. We have a lot of fun stuff to talk about. I want to talk about Strange Works. I want to talk about quantum. Sure. We're talking about open source, and we're going to talk about virtual reality. Uh, but first and foremost, welcome home. I, I believe you just had a pretty fun corporate retreat this past month. Yeah, yeah. We just, uh, the team, uh, we had an opportunity and we took it. Uh, we could have spent some money and flown some of our key employees from Europe over here next month. Or since our chief scientist was in Puerto Rico with his family already, uh, it was actually cheaper to fly everybody to Puerto Rico, thanks to a Scott's cheap flight thing that came through. <laughs> and uh, we just decided and like a week and a half out and said, let's do it. We're going to move the meeting up and go there. Uh, amazing time. Of course, Puerto Rico is still in need of so much help. You go down there and it's so sad to see all the buildings and all the damage from the hurricane. And it's so much time has passed. And yet there's still, you know, so much work that needs to be done there. So we thought, you know, go down there, uh, you know, support the local economy doing stuff, meet, you know, Cesar's family. And, and they made a wonderful meal and hosted at their house and basically just start thinking about where do we go from here? Like we looked at, you know, we run thing in kind of one year and three year phases and we're, we're exited the three year phase and we're kind of starting to figure out what the next plan is. And uh, it was an extremely productive trip. Uh, and I was, uh, I think it was good for, it's always good for morale too, especially in the days of COVID, right? For people to be able to get out and do something. And so obviously we had a lot of, pre you know, precautions, everybody's vaccinated. You know, we only traveled in, you know, some vans we had rented and stuff like that. Try to really cut down any, any exposure with the Delta variant out there. Uh, but everybody made it back safe. Uh, we did tests before and tests after and uh, had a great productive trip. Puerto Rico is a pretty beautiful place. I think is I think there's a lot more there than, than people know because I, I don't think enough people have actually taken the time and go and visit, but I would definitely encourage everybody to to do that. It was pretty awesome. I enjoyed following along with your Twitter feed. I felt like I was there on the trip from some of the pictures you were putting out there. But where do we go from here indeed? You know, let's start by by chatting about strange works. Because like you said, three years in now, uh, you guys are developing a platform for quantum computing. And it seems like you are agnostic as to who the providers of the hardware are. Uh, you just want to, it seems, make it as easy as possible for companies to get plugged in to quantum computing for defining projects. Is that the goals of well, StrangeWorks? Well, the, the idea, you know, what we started with uh, when we launched and what we, we're still rolling with is humanizing quantum, right? Uh, we probably should at this point switch to one of our other trademarks, which is hurting Schrodinger's cats. But, uh, you know, we're, we're going with it. We're going to, I almost timed that with your drink. It was really close. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> that was unintentional, but very close. But, but yeah, the, the idea here is that, you know, I believe that 1923, uh, and you think about the, the roaring 20, so to speak, in the industrial revolution and everything is going to look like 2023, except it's going to be the quantum revolution, right? You're going to start seeing companies spun out of, of these large companies uh, to do networking things and cryptography and all of these things that are, that are quantum. Uh, use quantum mechanics or in quantum inspired. And so I think there's this huge opportunity and I want to make sure everybody has as much opportunity to play in it. Because if you think back to 1963, which also is what 2023 uh, looks like to me, you have Jack, you know, coming out with a microprocessor. Nobody's thinking about drones or autonomous vehicles or AI or any of this stuff. I think this is going to be one of the biggest uh, shifts in computing uh, that we've had. Now it's not going to replace classical computers, but there's going to be a whole new set of these, these dreams. And we live in this crazy world right now. I mean, come on, Elon Musk just stood out on stage. was like, here's a robot I'm building, which is weird since he spent a lot of time talking about, I'm not really a fan of robots. So, uh, you know, if I worked in a Tesla factory, I'd be worried right now because I'd be like, oh, it, it can be overpowered by a human. We can probably do 400 Model Y <laughs> hatchbacks in, in an hour. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's such, a, such an amazing time we're living in and with quantum computing becoming very real much faster than people thought and there's still a long way to go we're in this noisy intermediate era 
But I think that the progress is in the last three years is, is astounding. And I think it's going to continue to accelerate as we move in the future. And I'm expecting a major inflection point around 2023. Right. That's when I, I know Google said they're coming out with their machine in 2029 and there's all this other stuff, but around 2023, maybe uh, the tail end into 2024, I think you're going to see a lot more eyeballs on quantum, a lot more investment and a lot more, more action in the space. Just a reminder for everyone watching, quantum computing is not just faster computers. They're completely different architectures than classical computing is. Uh, Worley's done a great job at describing quantum computing in the past. He spoke to a packed house at, Qu at a South by Southwest a couple of years ago. In fact, he's even written a book, Quantum Computing for Babies. Uh, if you see the signature up there, Worley, I would like to point out, this is your first, first signed first copy book. of the book you ever had is, is right is, here. That's that my claim to fame. Get it, get it to eBay as fast as possible. No. <laughs> I'm holding this one. Do I read it? With I, don't even, I, don't even know, I don't even know. I don't know if you, if you know if you could sell that book for more than you could buy a new one on Amazon for. But uh, but that is the first one. I'll never forget. We met at South by. I had just received them and you got the first copy. And that was awesome. And that was a great interview then. Um, you know, and, and you're right. So, you know, what is quantum? Uh, think about it this way. The, the classical computer called classical computing you know, the iPad, the iPhone, your Mac, whatever, maybe your Windows person or you're using a, a supercomputer, it doesn't matter. They all work on a binary system. And so if you take a coin, put it heads up in your palm and it's a, you know, a one, flip it over, it tails, it's a zero. And in your hand, it can only be one of those two things. Take that same coin, flip it in the air. When it's the apex of that spin, it's in a quantum superposition, which is not being one and zero at the same time, which is what everybody says. And when I initially got in here is, how I had interpreted you, but more importantly, it is uh, a probability of a one or a zero. So when you think of the way probabilities work and these kind of large, you know, matrices and things you can do, you can get to answers or find solutions a lot faster. Like you can use things like Grover's algorithm to find a needle in a haystack of needles, right? Looking for an oracle and you can pick that out. And, and, and a classical computer might take thousands of years, or in some cases, millions of years to do that. And a quantum computer might take Oh, we don't know. It won't be millions of years, probably won't be a year, but it could be months or weeks or days or hours. And, and so these won't make cat videos on the internet faster, as I told you in that original interview, at which I went and rewatched before we came here, uh, but it will open all whole new areas of science, right? So new material sciences, you want to go to Mars, you want to set a colony on Mars, probably going to need the kind of power of quantum computing to do that in an effective manner. You want to discover new drugs, you want to come up with new financial trades, things like that. These are these large, complex problem sets are what these things are going to be good at. So they're not going to replace your computer. I don't believe you're going to have a desktop version of them anytime soon. Although I know other people you've talked to that do have said that. Uh, I, I I would love that. Um, and I think that it's just the biggest shift in quant in computing over the last hundred years. And it's all going to happen between now and 2030. I think. I think you know, the, the time to get involved is now, the time to be looking uh, at investment is actually now that a lot of the risk has been boiled out of the market. Um, it's still risky, uh, but certainly when we talked, it wasn't, it was, it's nowhere near as risky as that anymore. Just if you look at the amount of uh, governments, France over $2 billion pledge, Sweden over a billion, you've got more money coming out of the US with the new endless frontiers. Uh, a lot of that will go to quantum, Germany, a couple of billion. Italy now, you know, China obviously has been investing since we talked originally. So you've got that, but you've also got venture money has come into the space uh, fairly heavy, as has private equity. And more importantly, as you know, a lot of these companies are starting to SPAC, working on their DSPACs. And, and there's already companies like QCI that are public, and there's already publicly traded companies that may very well be spinning things off. We saw the Honeywell QCI spinoff, right? Uh, so this is a pretty exciting time to be in the space, but also to be looking at investment in it, in my, in my opinion. Let me double click on those SPACs in a moment, Worley. But, but first, let's get back to what you just said about 2023. Uh, because like you said, we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in this space. Obviously, it's very disruptive in computing as a whole. We've done the best that we can in solving things like material science or drug development or wherever the places that quantum computing could be applied. But this could really unlock a whole lot of value that was just completely unfeasible before. Uh, the 2023 number is an interesting one because there's some forecasts out there that said that today, or more specifically back in 2018, less than 1% of companies had any kind of budget whatsoever 
for quantum computing. Oh, I, in fact, I, I would I, say it's very I, close I would, to zero. <laughs> I would, I would, I would think that that is the case still today. Correct. Um, but, but um, I would also say that large-scale enterprises, although they often see themselves as innovative, are often kind of not early adopters but late adopters. And so I wouldn't be worried about like I don't look at budget. All right, starting to get them in pharma and finances and stuff, and they're small. Like you're hundred percent right. And everybody, I every time I see an interview or see somebody talk about like do a billion dollars in quantum, the next is like you are a hundred percent not. <laughs> but <laughs> but but what I track is how many people at those enterprises are playing around with frameworks and toolkits and computers and things like that. That if you look at when I left Goldman Sachs to start Strangeworks, uh, there wasn't really a quantum team. There's maybe a couple of people, right? And now like Will Zeng's over there and they built out a team, I don't know, 30, 40 people, maybe there's more. There's a, there's a considerable uh, group of very talented finance people and physicists working together on the applications of quantum and finance. And they're not the only one, right? They're, 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 I'd say very few farm, farm, uh, finance companies don't have it. And then you go to pharma and obviously, you know, they, they, they completely have all of the key problems, right? They understand exactly what they need. They run, uh, you know, molecular uh, bindings uh, and some of those experiments, they run them on these NVIDIAs, maybe they're six or nine months uh, mm. to finish a set and the modeling and stuff. So, you know, there's, there's plenty of appetite for faster compute in all of these industries, but until it comes out, I mean, look, it's gonna be just like quantum computing it will be just like the internet. So remember when Barnes and Noble was like, Amazon, we don't need a website to sell books. Have you seen all the stores? That's a pretty direct one of relation to what I think in a couple of years, people will say about quantum. They'll be like, well, I mean, I don't know. We've got an HBC center. And it's like, right, but they do two different things, right? And so once that happens and people show something demonstrable that has a big return on investment, I think you're going to see that change a lot fast. And just like the adoption of the internet or any new technology, right? You're going to see this like kind of slow uh, stop at the beginning, and then you're going to hit an inflection point. And you look at any of the major technological changes, that that's not a newsflash, right? I mean, that's how how these things most often uh, end up in the market. I mean, you know, go back to IBM's CEO saying, "There's no need for three or four computers in the whole world," right? <laughs> like. Glad we didn't listen to that guy. <laughs> my, my entire career is based on the exact opposite of that. So, so, you know, I think that while there's no budgets, you're starting to see the work happen. And then you're going to see progress made in the number of qubits. Ion traps will soar first. Uh, then, then there'll be some, I believe, there'll be some physical limits to the physics. You've got people like Nick Farina over at ARQ doing helium stuff. You've got all the cold atom guys, of course, atom computing uh, just recently got some funding. Psy Quantum just did a four hundred fifty million dollar round, uh, and and all the specs and stuff that you're going to come back to later. But it's like there is activity in the space that I think now that momentum carries through and it makes the market real. Three years ago, three and a half years ago, when we talked, uh, we weren't there. Right? There was a lot of country investment. There was some VC investment. Everything was very hardware focused. You're going to see between now and the end of the year several software. Uh, companies uh, make pretty considerable funding announcements, right? Uh, and you might even see some SPAC, and you might even see some other action. I think that that you know, I'd say, well, the SPACs they'll 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 announce it this year, and then you know, sometime next year they'll de-SPAC, right? Like, I still don't think anybody in quantum that's spacking understands exactly how complicated that mechanism is. But you know, that's that's me. Maybe they maybe they do. So let's chat about that because uh, really our audience for Seven Investing is individual investors, right? And we're seeing those SPACs, we're seeing those those makers of quantum computers coming to the public markets, right? IonQ, $2 billion yeah. valuation, middle of a SPAC right now. Uh, we saw Honeywell is now actually spinning off one of its quantum divisions, yeah. also going public from a SPAC. Quantum Computing Incorporated, not a SPAC, but publicly traded right now and it's available. I, and, and, was the, and, and, and to their credit, was the first you know, correct, so, correct. so you're starting to see these things in a public market. Look, my prediction is public How markets. How do you feel about be, these? Really? That was my question. I think, I think yeah. public markets will be very hard on quantum. That's my opinion. Nobody agrees with me. Everybody, you know, oh, public, private, you know, two pools of funding, all of this. I, I think if you have any 
in propriety, and, and there's none that I know of, but in all industries, there's going to be, as it starts becoming more attractive and more money, people get greedy. You know, you get, you got the, ba- you got the balance, the counterweights, right. And you got the, the short sellers to come in and say, well, Quana, he said in an interview that it was going to happen in three years. It's been five years and it hasn't, and there's little revenue. So let's short that, right? Like, I, I think, I think, Spacking puts a, a very big target on on your chest that I don't think the industry needs right now. So I'm not a not a fan of the spacs. Um, I'll announce mine in March. I'm just kidding. I won't do that. <laughs> but uh, but 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 I understand the need for them in the industry because this is hard and it is a very deep tech. And pulling in hundreds of millions of dollars sounds a lot. Some of these things sound overvalued. Maybe they will be moving on, but we can't talk out of both sides of our mouths. We can't say this will be trillions of dollars a market, but you got to look at Peter and say, I mean, dude, that's back 2 billion. You really think you're worth that? It's like, I mean, one of those has to, to, to not be true, right? We, you know, we, we can't say quantum computing is going to change the world, be this massive uh, shift in humanity as far as what we compute and how AI is used and, material sciences and drug discovery and finance and the list goes on and on and on. And then say, but I mean, those guys think they're worth $2 billion with a piece of hardware. It's like, you know, th- those numbers match. And, and the thing I'd like to see in the community and with investors is people take a realistic viewpoint. You either believe it's worth trillions of dollars and then you understand why they're worth that much, or you don't believe either of those, right? But you can't believe it's worth trillion of dollars, but then nobody's worth any money in the space. That's, that doesn't make sense to me. Like not at all, because you 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 you're you you're not making a direct comparison. Everybody wants to compare quantum to a bunch of different businesses that that are irrelevant, and we have not seen the impacts of quantum. And when you say quantum, you say quantum computing. Know that Cisco is working on quantum internet networking. The government just announced a, a big sixty one million dollar funding package for quantum information science. What about quantum sensors? Right? What about quantum sensors in oil and gas? What about quantum sensors in medical and these other air fields? So quantum is much bigger than computing. And some of these companies that are spacking, I don't know what their plans are, but I would imagine a few of them have plans beyond just a just a compute, right? Just a device. Um, and so this is going to be an incredible opportunity area for investors. But because it's so complicated in deep tech, you know, really have to start judging these companies. I think not on the tech or the or the science but on the same fundamentals you would do any other trade. It's going to take patience, right? It's going to take investor A patience. lot of patience. Biotech yeah, yeah, yeah. companies, not, same not, thing, right? We, we get quarterly results from biotech companies, but in reality, it's, are they commercializing new drugs? That might be years that's out. Right. That's right. Quantum computing, yeah. we don't care about the quarterly earnings. We care about the, the problems that they're solving out there. Well, look at Pfizer and J&J and Moderna, right? The, the Moderna, the vaccine for COVID kind of made Moderna, but I'm sure, there, and there's other stuff they've done, but I mean, that's an example in a, in a biotech, there's an event, there's something and oh no, they have this cure for this or this thing, Alzheimer's, cancer, whatever. All of a sudden that thing that's been kind of just trudging along is, you know, billions and tens of billions of dollars. Um, I think, you know, that's a, an okay way to look at quantum. I think it's different than that. I think there's immediate, you know, uh, availability of these machines today. Uh, they're not, you know, people are like, well, they don't have 400 qubits or a million qubits. Well, that's true, but most of the circuits people are writing right now are like seven qubits, right? They're, we're playing around. We're like trying to figure out how does this apply in these areas? Where can we shoot, show these proof points? Where is there, you know, we've moved from quantum supremacy to quantum advantage, right? So we're gonna say, okay, this has an advantage and that advantage could be in speed or performance or cost or whatever. And these machines are gonna be great for the environment too, because they use a fraction of the energy of, a, of, of an HPC center. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to consider when you're looking at this. And I think, you know, the market has changed so much in the three and a half years since we sat down the first time that it is absolutely deserving of, of everybody paying extremely close attention to it. And if we talk again in another three and a half years, it will have moved further than I think anybody realizes today. Uh, and that includes all of my friends that are physicists and my investor friends that are investing in this. <laughs> I, I, just think, I just think everybody doesn't understand that it's got the financial momentum, billions and billions of dollars being poured in. It has some of the smartest people on the planet working on this. And they're starting to go from 10 people over here to 130 person team, like with Frank Lehman in, in Stuttgart, right? Or, uh, you know, go into China. They've now got three companies building quantum machines and then now they're not sell, 
sharing them outside of there. Uh, and I wish they would, but of course, you know, the geopolitics of is going to come in and affect quantum. And we talked about that in our first interview. I think you're starting to see that, right? Like Australia has just put a lot of deep tech, tech stuff on an export list. The U S is certainly looking at it. China is an exporting. So, so, you know, one of the fears I have for an investor is if you're not investing in the U S or you're investing in the U S what if the biggest market is somewhere that, you know, you can't sell the machine or what if there's a problem with the import thing? So take a dilution fridge. What if that's, you know, or helium that some of these things need, right. Which is something that we're, 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 we're running out of, right. Like it's not, you know, so it's like, there's a lot of, of, of um, points of concern, but at the end of the day, when you have this much money, you know, billions and billions and tens of billions and, and, and probably a couple hundred billion dollars it's in or coming into the space. And you have this many people that are literally the best in the field at IBM, at INQ, at you know, all of these companies, Cy Quantum and Atom Computing and AeroQ and all these amazing, I mean, you know, I probably just pissed off, you know, 15 other hardware people because I didn't, because I didn't, you know, because I can't think of their names that I'm going. Yeah. And they're all wonderful. Like they are all amazing, which is what's great about our business is because we're building an infrastructure layer that, that you know, the users and all the hardware providers can, can play on. And uh, it, it's amazing to see. I mean, I hope there's, yeah, you know, they don't, but I hope there's 50 more, you know, and you look at what Lexamo is doing, right? Alexi is making uh, specialized chips uh, for quantum for just a specific task. Uh, River Lane, what they're doing with their system on a chip. Like this has come a long way since we talked three years ago, but we're still all focused on the wrong goals, right? People are still trying to patent algorithms. Bad idea. You shouldn't patent math. I'm just, I'm never going to not be against that. I'm old school patent guy. Um, but you could patent the circuits. That's very interesting, right? Uh, everybody's trying to build communities of large users, but really what we want is the time on these machines being booked, right? So I feel like we, 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 we're just slightly off uh, in the alignment of the enterprise and the market timing. And I think over the next couple of years, those things kind of fit in. And when they do, they're going to instantly lock. And when that, when that bond is made, quantum computing takes off and, and literally legends will be made in the space. I don't want to be one of those. I just want to watch all of them and, and, uh, and, and cheer them on from the sideline. Uh, but there, but, but it's, there are a lot of extremely smart, extremely deserving people. You, know, you look at Ari Tushman at Entanglement Technologies, right? And, and that team and what they're doing with quantum sensing. Uh, in environmental areas. Like this is going to spill far beyond computing, far beyond everything. And it's going to touch every aspect of our lives at some point in the not too distant future. Unfortunately, you and I will live to see that day, right? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not that old, but in 30 years, I'm going to be doing a startup where it's a new technology. I'm probably going to die before it becomes real, but you know. <laughs> well, you said you're not doing a spec, but if you do do a spec, I'm your first investor in it. I'm telling all my friends to also buy it. I, I so have you, a lot of faith so you in want, you on this one. You want, you want how many shares that are couponed at $10? <laughs> Count me in. <laughs> Count me in as many as I, I can buy. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's a, I mean, I don't know. You know, yeah, SPACs are uh, SPACs are interesting, but I'm I'm uh, I, I'm going to stick to uh, a very um, traditional, very focused uh, approach to how we're funding it. Remember, we are the smallest, almost not anymore. Now there's two and three person shops, but of the companies you hear about in the news all the time, we're the smallest, least funded one. And, and there's a strategy there. Everybody else is raising hundreds of millions of dollars. I've raised four or five, you know, like I'm going to raise more soon. Uh, but it's like, I think quantum is a marathon with a series of sprints. And, and I think I want to raise right before the sprints happen to catch those waves and keep up and not just be like, oh, I mean, like, what if you gave me $300 million? Like, I, I mean, we would, where would we deploy that capital, right? It, getting investment is about leveraging that money. And, and for us, it's leveraging less money to get direct revenues, to get to profitability as fast as possible. You know, it's, it's the, even though quantum's amazing tech, the rules of business won't change, right? The, the, the rules of the market won't change. The market will find the things that are BS and they'll eject them and they'll find the things that aren't profitable and they'll devalue them and, and on and on and on, right? That's kind of the, kind of the interesting thing about the market is it, it does work. Um, and with a new technology like this, it's gonna be very interesting to see how it works. Speaking speaking of that, the technology and the IP behind this, do you see quantum developing 
regionally where, you know, obviously chip making company, chip, chip making industry is global, right? You, everybody's selling to everybody across the entire world, but you kind of see these political tensions, right? Of like quantum supremacy is, does China have a faster quantum computer? You know, how is that going to impact internet security and everything else that's being talked about out there? Is everyone yeah. going to use each other's technologies or are we going to have different quantum in the US or North America than Europe or China has? Well, so that's a great question. And the geopolitics of this are coming in um, right on schedule, right? I, everybody thinks, here's the problem. People like you, and, I, and, and, and I, I mean, in your industry, doing the podcast, talking about investing, I, I think they're overselling what it is and where it does. Don't get me wrong. I believe it's trillions of dollars in, in market. I believe it changes the world. But right now, I believe there's still some time period between those. So when you look at something like security and you say, oh, you know, the same way that happens, I think people say, oh, quantum computers break all security. It's like, well, okay, well, hang on, that's maybe not true. And what we're really about was worried about in the security industry is we're really worried about very specific things. So for example, we know that files that were encrypted 20 years ago have been leaked and you can't really break them on, on a uh, computer you probably break those on a quantum computer, right? So we're trying to post quantum protect materials over here. There's already materials that are leaked and people are trying to get the tech to break them. Security is, is kind of a, a, a shit show, right? I build a wall, you knock it down, I build a bigger wall. Uh, my investment partner, Mike Irwin and I, we founded a company called Symbia that was infamous for building countermeasures for, uh, for you know, on, on the internet, because until there's a, a repercussion of financial damage, it's going to continue to be in that thing. And so, mm. yeah, no kidding. Uh, you know, making a key longer so that it takes you more time and resource to break it. That doesn't sound like the greatest security plan anyway, right? That sounds like eventually you get to some number of qubits and I don't know how long you would make stuff where quantum wouldn't just break it. And people are working on all these different ways of encryption. And I have no doubt that they'll fix it because you can remember something called the Enigma machine. And that was... And at the time, the state of the art, no one could do anything with it, right? Like you could not break it. And so, you know, you, you've, you, you look back historically and you say, why are we worried about quantum computers breaking security? Like we know they're coming. We're going to work on it. We'll do what we've always done and advanced it. But you look at, you know, why do we not use uh, 128 uh, RSA keys anymore? Right? Why do we not use, I mean, it's because we advance. The tech advances and security advances with it. And I have faith that the people in the security industry, uh, especially some of the new startups, even the ones that are focused on stuff like supply chain management, the threat warriors of the world and stuff like that, they will be taking all of this into their, into their, um, into their uh, thoughts and, and designs. And I think they'll work with quantum companies and you'll have a security that will, will go past this quantum era. I don't think it's the end of security or privacy or anything. I think we over dramatize that a lot in, in uh, outside of the industry, I think if you talk to anybody in the industry, it's like, well, yeah, no kidding. As computational stuff advances, you know, you got to advance how you're protecting it and change the, the way you're doing keys and the way you're managing stuff or whatever the case may be. The biggest security leak has and always will be people, right? Like most of the stuff you see that are breaches aren't because quantum computer prototype was used to break the key for all of these records at company X. It was somebody that works there and has a password sold it and they got caught. Right. So, you know, I don't know that security is in some horrible state now. I mean, we've, you know, we've got all of these different things that affect, you know, the average Joe, right. You've got the, the phishing scams and the this and that, but I don't know. I, I think it's more prevalent, but I don't know if it's any worse than it used to be. Uh, you know, I can remember people getting a uh, ransomware in the nineties, you know, but, you know, John Oliver talked about it two weeks ago, like it was, you know, the, this new thing. And it's like, yeah, that's been going on. You know, uh, I, I have high hopes that quantum will actually improve security, not because it will force it to change, but because we will start thinking about things using quantum mechanics or be completely new security paradigms, completely new investment paradigms, completely new uh, AI uh, modeling and, and quantum machine learning and things like that. So I have, I have faith that it's going to help. I don't think securities and as much will be in as much disarray because of quantum that, that people, uh, that people think it will be. Biden administration is calling for zero trust architecture for cybersecurity measures out there. He's calling for all companies and all government institutions to adopt this. 
Does that integrate with quantum? Any thoughts on the states of cybersecurity? I mean, look, state of cybersecurity is, uh, I think, you know, I'm a big fan of, of threat work. Full disclosure, I invested in it too, okay? Uh, because you look at these attacks, they're supply chain attacks, right? So the attacks have moved from, you know, like, uh, I think what the Biden administration doing is admirable. I think definitely think everyone should have a great security policy and be working on it. But, but the attacks are moving. Now the attacks are like a vendor of a vendor used some software and that's where the problem is. And it goes all the way up the chain, right? The supply chain uh, management. Think about killer chips and jets, right? What are we worried about right now? We're worried that all the chips are made in China and they could have some piece of code that just kills that chip. And then a you know $80 million plane doesn't work, right? So it's like, I think we have to start shifting our perspective in, in uh, security um, we have to make it a little bit more far reaching. It's not just about what you do for security. It's about what the people on Zoom did that we're using to record this right now. It's what the uh, host at AWS or Google or Azure or wherever Zoom is hosted did for their security that we're by the way, both using right now. It's what are the components they use to build those services that by the way, we're using right now, right? Like it's gotten much more complicated as it goes deeper down the stack and across things to where I think a focus in security on the supply chain of where that software is coming from, what software is integrated. I think you're going to see a lot more of, of that. Uh, and I think that's a huge opportunity here. As I said, full disclosure, I invested in, in, in a company because I believe in that. I mean, that's where my focus on, on cybersecurity is today. I'd like to use that as a segue to talk about open source. I know you have a lot of background in this too, Worley, as a software developer. But we've kind of seen, at least from cloud computing's perspective, you've got the cloud titans out there, right? You've got Azure, like you said, Microsoft, yep. you've got Amazon Web Services, everybody builds on the infrastructure they have out there. It's all about these ecosystems of people kind of using the, the big guys' tools and the ecosystems that they build. Uh, but then we've kind of seen even them kind of moving more to open source, right? You've got GitHub, the acquisition that we just saw, um, Microsoft buying GitHub, but then also IBM buying Red Hat. I mean, even the big players are saying more and more we want open source. You see Kubernetes out there, you know, new way to start bringing containers in for software development and things like this. How do you see the future of open source developing and where do you think it's offering the most value in corporate America? I mean, like open source drives 90% of corporate America anyway, right? From, from Brian Bailendorf going from a fledgling uh, a, a website administrator at a fledgling magazine called Wired to the Apache Foundation and stuff. Uh, open source is always in there. Most of these products people are building, they're downloading code off of GitHub, right? Like we've, we have, de there's developers that write code, right? And there's all the people that went to coding schools that although they, they write code, and they understand the basics. They're really chaining together pieces of open source, people, other stuff. So it's permeated everything. I, I doubt there is a piece of closed software uh, source software outside of like a secret government project that hasn't had open source touch it in some way. And of course, you know, we've already been through all the licensing battles and all of that. Um, I think the, 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 I said the future was open in, in 93. I think uh, we're in the future. I think it's very open. I mean, just look at the, the resources you have now. I think uh, open source can help quantum in that, you know, originally Strangeworks started as a Linux foundation project. I was going to go and, and create a giant open source infrastructure and nobody wanted to work together. So I said, well, I'll start a company to do it. Now I think people are starting to open up a little more. And of course, every quantum company has frameworks in open source. Uh, security companies have a, a very good stance on open source. You know, there's an the argument of more eyeballs and the code. There's also the arguments of, you know, too many committers and somebody slides something in. So I think you have to be really, you know, balanced on, on the view of open source, but it, it's everywhere. It, it, it has... It has been a, a standard in software development for uh, over 25 years, 30 years, and, and, it, and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. What you're talking about is investment opportunities. How can you look at, is there a company that uses open source and does that drive value or describe value to that company? In the case of Red Hat, um, frankly, I don't think IBM should have paid what they paid for. I think Red Hat's an amazing company. I think Jim Whitehurst is a phenomenal CEO and did an incredible job. Uh, and then they, they had the value. There's no doubt they're tremendously valuable. Uh, but, you know, I think IBM overpaid. And I think, um, you know, IBM doesn't give itself enough credit for all the open source it does. I mean, it has a billion open source projects, right? Um, you look at the transactions, 
I don't think it's about whether the software is open or closed. I think it's about the value that the user gets, the monetary transaction that the company gets for that value. And then what is the EBITDA? Like I said, all these things are going to come back to basic fundamentals of, of, of companies, right? Um, the only problem is a lot of this area, when you look at some of the new security stuff, when you look at quantum, you look at these areas, we're new, we're new fields. And, and so, you know, it's going to take a little while to, to gel. But I, I think open source has been the greatest thing to happen in software ever. Uh, I think it has advanced things. I think it'll continue to advance things. I'd like to see more uh, open source examples of, of quantum algorithms and, and quantum code and things like that. Uh, we're working with universities today to do that. We're working with partners to in our quantum syndicate, uh, which has grown tremendously, like pretty much everybody's in that. Um, we're looking to work with them on how can we take the code that's open because that's the only way to give it to somebody and let them use it, right? Can't take proprietary code and give it to a pharma company and be like, go build all your stuff on this thing we've done that then we're gonna try to come and sue you because we patented it or whatever. Uh, you can get them to adopt stuff by saying, here's code that's under a license that you can take and integrate with what you're doing and go do. So, you know, open source has just, the benefits are, are countless. And, you know, a lot of people, that leads to a lot of people saying, well, why isn't StrangeWorks platform open source? It's like, well, we do contribute to open source uh, in some of the things that we integrate. Uh, and we are going to be announcing our own, open, we have some open source, but not anything big. We're going to be announcing some bigger stuff uh, as we move into the future. Um, is just like what we're building would be, you, know, you have to think about, it, is a project useful as an open source project? Um, the incredible plumbing that we have built is probably not useful to anybody open except for a competitor that wants to do what we're doing. Um, so, it's, so, you know, it has different uh, values in different times. I personally think, you know, a good, some stuff you, you keep proprietary, some stuff you have open, that's always been my stance in open source. Yeah. I think it's a, a valuable. For example, you have a platform, you have a way to connect to the platform for a hardware provider. It's probably a good thing to have open, right? So they can see the code and understand it, see what it's doing. Uh, you have a platform and you have a super customized optimization. Maybe that is your value and that needs to be proprietary. I mean, it just, it depends. It's a case per case basis on the open source software. Speaking of open source, I believe that your name, Whirly, was associated with with Unix, right? The Unix operating system where you're... you're... Uh, well, uh, well, a long, long time ago, Sebastian Hassinger, who is coming into Austin tomorrow, and I was going to have drinks with him, and now maybe I'll like punch him in the face. Now, he, <laughs> he, put, he put Whirly into uh, a system at Apple. He and Mike Irwin and I were all working there and locked in that name to never be changed, as opposed to... Uh, me getting a cool name like he was Singe and Mike was Draconis and they had all these cool names. So yeah, it, it kind of that and it kind of grew in the open source community a little bit and not big. I mean, I'm not, you know, Taras Baylog or you know Ethan Gallstad or Brian Millendorf. I've, I've never created some big open source project. I would just help with a bunch of projects and help. But I kind of built the reputation there. And then in 2016, I hosted President Obama at South by, uh, you know, and uh, you showed me that clip. I remember a couple that. years. And then he said it, and then you know my mother-in-law calls me Willie. So you know I don't I don't care Will William Willie anything. Can't call me Bill. That's my dad's name. Don't call me Billy. My mom calls me that. I'm not a fan. <laughs> Willie has stuck. It's stuck for for a couple of decades. Um, I wanted yeah, to stuck for a while now. Let's transition talking about open source. Let's also talk about virtual reality. It's a fun little spin on this one too, Worley, because I know that you have a background. What was it? Chaotic Moon Labs, where you guys were actually kind of doing the interfaces with people. And, and devices and things like that. But I mean, it seems like everyone's talking about VR and the metaverse these days. Is this all hype or is there something to this? Yeah, I, I'm, I am very openly not a fan. So I moderated Stanford, MIT's virtual labs on AR and on VR. Um, I helped co-found uh, the augmented reality event, which is the, the big event for that stuff. And, and I worked on some of the stuff back at Apple in the early days and even worked on it for customers uh, at Chaotic in the, in the early kind of 2010, 2012 timeframe. Um, putting a screen this close to your face is never going to be a good idea. You're just going to burn your retinas out, right? Um, uh, AR, if you want that, Chris, uh, Christoph Koch says it best in the movie, The Singularity, kind of a documentary on all these kind of things you're talking about. He says, 
oh, to do that, you'd have to pop your eyeball out and put a synthetic eyeball in it. It worked with the way your brain and your optic nerves and everything works. And he's like, I'd be the first to sign up. That's so exciting. <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> you know, uh, in 1993, um, there were three primary uses for AR, VR. And, and people think AR is, you know, like, I mean, none of this is new. This goes back to like the 60s where there were physical devices, right? So this is not new. So you look at the history of it and you say, let's just say since 1990, 2021, right? So 31 years ago, what were people selling on air? They said, oh, it'll train people in dangerous situations without it doing, okay? Still not doing that, right? If you go to an AR conference today, you will be sold on in the future, the same vision I heard 31 years ago. Um, oh, it'll be used for gaming. And you see things that blow up, right? Pokemon Go blew up, but like, are you hearing about it anymore? Can you name one other AR game? Like any game, right? And in VR, you see like Facebook bought Oculus. I've always thought all the investors in Facebook must have been face investors in Oculus or something. There was something, something there that just doesn't make sense. Either that or Mark Zuckerberg has read way too much William Gibson and he's like, holy <laughs> crap, in the future, everybody be on universal income strapped to a chair with a VR thing on drugs, right? You know, so that we, we placate the, the masses. Um, and, and that's a scary thought. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you think about it, I, 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 I don't want to say it's pointless. It, obviously, there's, there's things you could do and it, it absolutely makes sense. But AR and VR fall in the category of just because you can do something doesn't mean you should, right? Like, like how many times a day do you use VR? How, let me ask you a different. How many times a day does anybody you know use VR? Can you even name a person you know who's a fan who uses VR more than once a month? No, actually I can't. To be honest with you, and I do not use I, it on a daily basis either. No, but 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 even the people I know that are in the industry that work at some of these companies, they're always calling me about about their careers, and I'm like, you're still hawking the same stuff, right? Like, I'm not gonna let my kids have an AR game set, why a VR game set? Why? Is it one they're just gonna destroy the house, right? We don't, we don't, we don't. <laughs> we're missing all the other stuff you need around it, like. Motion, over the you know, lamps, sure, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. When you get to a Star Trek holodeck, call me. I'll put my kids <laughs> in there for hours. But I mean, the, the reality is, is we're not there, and I just don't think it has as much um, use as people uh, want to imagine it has. What about Magic Leap? Like big AR company? billions and billions and billions of dollars. Where are they today? Still, what are they doing? Mostly R and D, right? Yeah. Right? Again, you want to replace your eyeball, okay? You want to build a, a, a holodeck or something. Those all sound super awesome. And eventually people will do that. But, but AR and VR, it's, it's, it's not practical. When Motorola first sold the golden eye, you remember those headsets? They were red headsets with that, that little screen right here. And they sent them out to oil rigs for, because it's a dangerous environment. And that's where people are going to use them. What do they do? Whoops, off in the ocean. I don't want anybody monitoring that. But those those roughnecks, those wildcatters aren't like, you know, oh yeah, let me report exactly everything I'm doing. That, that thing went in the in the trash. So there's even a question of, you know, in some of these dangerous industries industries you're talking about, would the would the workers even use them, or would they just see it as a, a you know, as a as a burden? Um, so I, I you know I don't want to I don't want to harp on it anymore. I have so many friends in that industry. If they see this, they'll be like. <laughs> God, why are you trying to put me out of a job? But there's a lot the of hype in it right now. That's that's the topic again. Metaverse and everything. It certainly seems like they're selling it. Yeah, but it, it's like, but 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 it's just. But but they talked about metaverse in the '80s, man. Like yeah. that's not a new. It's like AR just goes through the same cycles, and um and I don't remember. But if you go to Google, which I'm going to do right now, where we're talking a live demo, and, and, and people want to know, um, well, okay, look, I just typed in AR. And the first thing that popped up is AR and VR, why it hasn't worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to just type in this and see. Uh, let me see if I go. Yeah, if I, if I go to, uh, to AR, let me see if I do VR. Um, let's see when this was. Um, Oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm having trouble finding it because I think it's Bloomberg, but I, but I wrote a piece on this uh, years ago. 
um, uh, I just maybe it's not um, maybe it's not Bloomberg. Is it is it Wired? Anyway, I'll find this interview and send it to you. You can share it when you mail and stuff. But I did um, I, I did uh, uh, talk about it in November of 2014. And then before that, I had written a piece that was basically uh, why it hasn't went anywhere and why it won't go anywhere. And I will find that piece and send it to you to share with your audience. It's so far back in my background. I'd be willing to bet that everything I wrote 20 years ago, yeah. still true today. That's not an industry, right? Fair like enough, quant enough. quantum quantum taking, you know, 70 years, a hundred years to become reality since like the fifth century. That makes sense, right? Uh, ARs is, and the other thing is it's, it's positioned as an industry when it's just a feature. I mean, you saying that a virtual reality said set is an industry is equivalent of me saying, I have a screen on my iPhone. Uh, screens are their whole, no, it's a component. It's, it's an interface. It's, uh, it's part of something else. Not, I don't think it should be an a industry to itself. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my thought on, on that one. Um, <laughs> What, what, one more for you, Worley. One more question as we close this out. I, I want to ask you, I mean, you've seen some really progressive and innovative, innovative stuff out there. What is it you're really excited about right now? In, in quantum computing, in the internet, in open source, and anything we talked about, what is it that you see that's really got you interested? Well, uh, so first of all, environmental startups, very, very interested in those. Um, I love the idea that people are like, wait, maybe the environment could be solved with like entrepreneurship and startups. Super, super cool. Uh, so that's probably the most interesting thing to me. Um, you know, second to that, uh, of course, I started a fintech company before this. I love what I'm seeing in fintech and, and services, getting to people that are in underserved markets or communities, things like that. Those, those two things are very interesting because they have a direct impact on people's lives, right? Um, outside of that, uh, I mean, we live in the greatest time to be alive. I mean, think about, think about this. John Stewart made a YouTube short. Have you seen it? Called Dicks in Space about Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and Zucker and everybody billionaires going to space. Think about that for a second. He's making comedy, making fun of the rich guys going to space. And the point I would remind all of your viewers and listeners is they went into orbit, If you, because I sat on a plane with Buzz Armstrong one time and said space and I meant orbit and I got a three hour lecture on the whole flight on orbital mechanics. But um, <laughs> does nobody stop to go, yeah, but they went up there. Like that's mind blowing to think that we're thinking about these things. Like we're talking about going to Mars with, SpaceX and NASA and everything, and, and it's a it's a realistic thing that's going to happen, right? Elon Musk just introduced a humanoid robot this week. Like, what an incredible time to be alive! So, you know, if you want to get into it, there's a hundred fascinating things, right? Like, look at what Boston Dynamics has done in robotics. Look at what some of the carbon sequestration stuff uh, has done for the environment. What fintech has done. A company like Robinhood, Vlad, you know, and I met when we were when we were doing Honest Dollar. Look at what look at what those guys have done to uh, uh, bring all of these uh, you know financial resources to people that never had them before, right? Like this is this is an incredible time to be alive, and I think this is the time where technology really, really uh, comes in the, into this, like you know, driving the society forward. And I, and I stay on the positive trip of that. I don't see it as draconian stuff. Look at vaccines. What, what about these MMR vaccines? Like so many things that are going on right now that if you look historically and you look at it and you go, this is a time to be really paying attention as an investor to deep tech, which has now got faster paths to market, to in, in, you know, the environmental companies, to all of these things. What incredible time to be around. So it's like so many things, you know, I, it's why uh, eventually at some point I will, I will just be a, a GP uh, at the fund and and all I get to do is look at these amazing things and write them checks and watch everybody else work till two or three in the morning and <laughs> wake up to take their kids to school at 6 30 because since we've talked I've also turned 50 and so now the I'm like Danny Glover and Lethal Weapon 
too old for this shit. You know? <laughs> Still going strong though, Worley. I always appreciate hearing your opinions on what's going on out there and, and best wishes with strange work. It's uh, strange works in quantum computing. Thank I really you. appreciate you being on the podcast here this afternoon. Thanks for having me. It's great to talk to you again. And uh, let's not let it be three and a half years before we do it again. You got it. Sounds good. Looking forward to having Worley again in the future. Thanks again for tuning into this edition of our seven investing podcast. We're here to empower you to invest in your future. We are seven investing.